Welcome to Inspiring Women with Lori McGraw. I am your host, Lori McGraw. I have spent the past 30 years in leadership, and over the years, I've come to learn one thing. Women need women, and not just any women, but inspiring women. Tune in every week to hear from women at the pinnacle of their careers and from others who are just starting out. Episodes can be found at inspiringwomen.show or subscribe on your favorite podcast app. Thanks for listening, and I hope you will be inspired. Welcome to another episode of Inspiring Women, and today we're speaking with Becca Marks. Now, Becca is a Senior Finance Manager of Sales Operations at Granger. Granger is a Fortune 500 company. They're an industrial supply company that has international operations, multiple billions of dollars in terms of being a public company. They work on things like motors and lighting and materials. 3 million customers worldwide um, sales, and they have hundreds of branches. And Becca has been there for about 10 years. She's been there since she graduated from Indiana University, where she graduated from the School of Business. And Becca, I'm really excited to be speaking with you today. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, great. Well, listen, to start, your background is in finance and accounting, and your title is a senior finance manager. Now, that all sounds kind of generic. So why don't don't you tell us what you actually do? Great. I will talk a little bit about what my team does and what I do, because as a leader, and I'm sure other leaders can experience the same thing, they're a little different. So what I drive my team to help do is use data to find insights that drive action in the business, that it really all stems down to that. What we try to do is help the business understand what's happening, what trends are good, what trends are bad, what things we can do differently, and actually come up, help them come up with solutions to drive action that creates change. It's super exciting, gets me very energized. You know, my responsibilities are very similar to a lot of other leaders. It's about prioritizing, you know, taking away roadblocks, helping people think through and problem solve to find those solutions and and find those conclusions that can help the business move forward. From a finance lens, specifically supporting sales operations, I support things like pricing and gross profit. So how do price changes impact our overall P&L? What impacts can they have on volume? What impacts can they have on customer behavior and how customers see Granger as a partner? Things like contract realization. So are we getting what we should be getting out of our contracts? Where do we have opportunities for growth? Where are customers not using us as much as they can? And how can we help the sales team understand what extra value there is with some of those contract customers. So that's two examples of of things I support. Well, to me, that sounds like a lot of data, a lot of spreadsheets, a lot of like manipulation of data to understand it, which is always, I think that stuff is very interesting, but sometimes it's hard to sort of sort through a lot of information and then turn it into something that you can take action on. So that's what I'm hearing um, is getting you excited about what you do uh, at Granger. But Becca, as as you've been there for 10 years now, so that's a, that's a long time to be at a company and you've been there since you graduated. So what's, what's been keeping you there? Why is it so interesting? How are you not getting lost in a company with over 20,000 employees? Yeah, that's a great question. I think the thing that keeps me is the fact that there's always something new to learn in such a big organization. There's always a new opportunity. And I think Granger is really special because If you voice that, you know, maybe I'm thinking this is getting a little stale, maybe this isn't pushing me as hard as as it could, if you're a high performer or top performer, those opportunities are going to come your way to take on a special project. Or for example, the last big thing that happened to me was I said, I really want for my development to try to lead leaders. And through a couple organization changes, we were able to make that happen. And so I think being vocal about what it is you want to learn, what it is you want to do, and having the network of people who can help you find those solutions is really critical. I've been able to do that at my current organization. And so I haven't really felt a need to leave because I'm continuing to be challenged. 
consistently. And I'm just not feeling as though I'm bored in anything that I'm doing. There's always something new to explore. Well, you've also had eight promotions in 10 years. That sounds like a lot of promotions to me. So certainly putting the, you know, what you want forward sounds like that might be working for you as well. I want to move a little bit to the company orientation. So just in learning more about Granger to prepare to talk to you, Becca, I was focused, I was just looking at um, their diversity, equity, and inclusivity statements. Now, those are kind of hot topics these days, but it seems that this large Fortune 500 company is pretty purposeful um, in that approach. So just tell us what it looks like from the inside. Do the, the words on the web page um, are very, very clear in terms of the commitment to DEI, um, how that's important from the board level, from the executive management level. What does it look like from the inside? Yeah, we are doing a lot around DE&I, and it's something I'm super passionate about. The more voices and diverse voices in the room, the better the outcome. So it's it's something I'm definitely super passionate about. The tone from the top has been excellent, especially over this past year. We're facing into a lot, to say the least, in terms of the Black Lives Matter movement over the last couple years as it relates to the Me Too movement. And it really started with the tone from the top. So our CEO and our board and the leadership team came together and said, we need to start having important and impactful conversations in the workplace, which having worked for a few years was just, I thought these were topics you don't talk about at work, right? It's very politically driven sometimes, and it can be very uncomfortable. So how do you start those conversations? They started a program called Be Brave and trained all leaders on how to have Be Brave conversations with their teams. We practiced it as leadership teams first to make sure that we could structure them in a way that was inclusive and open and get a few tries under our belt before trying to to lead our teams through something that they had probably never talked about at work. That's definitely one way those conversations with my team have been some of the most impactful in terms of getting to know people as people, getting to share unique views and thinking about the world in a different way than maybe how I came to the table initially. It's been very eye-opening and and very humbling and very, I think, impactful in, in making us feel closer as a team. The other thing we're doing is around hiring, recruiting processes, making sure that we're taking out as much bias as we can, doing trainings on inherent biases, known and unknown to make sure that when we're evaluating talent, it really is as fair as possible so that we get diverse voices in our organization, that we have a diverse recruiting pool so the people interviewing you will look different and making sure that that then we have those diverse opinions in the room when it's time to debrief. Those are a couple examples of things I think the leadership team is doing really well to drive that DE&I mindset throughout the organization. Well, it's great that you're getting training and you're also, uh, you've been a manager for a couple of years and usually when, usually when you are an early manager and, uh, uh, and becoming a leader and you are a leader, you know, focusing on things like the development of employees and development of um, sort of like next level strategic thinking. Those are the kinds of things that usually I've seen um, people get training on, but with DEI, it's a lot more about culture and also about being more inclusive in ways that I will just say in my experience that hasn't been necessarily the focus of companies, but it's certainly critically important now. So are you feeling equipped? How does that match up with you know, your ability to influence a cult- culture? And again, I'm thinking about this more from the largeness, the size of your company, being able to have a voice as a um, earlier stage manager. Yeah, that's a great question. How I think I influence the whole, you know, control what you can control in your environment and show up every day the way that you want to, because your team sees that one of the ways is, is promoting talent from within my team and making sure that they're ready for the next steps, because I know that we've had these types of conversations and they're ready to take that to the rest of the organization. So I think as a leader, you have a huge responsibility to train your team for when they get promoted and become people leaders themselves, that that message gets spread across. I also think, you know, starting small is not a bad thing. Controlling what you can control in your environment is a way to impact the the larger organization because 
even if you work on a small team, we work very collaboratively, very cross-functionally. And so regardless of if, you know, I only have control over my small team, I'm interacting with a lot of different people every day. And it takes all of us acting in the right ways, making the right decisions to make a big change. So that's how I think I contribute to the overall organization's objectives. Great. Well, this podcast is inspiring women. So in your company, it's focused on things like motors and supply chain and industrial parts and things of that nature. Now, I think about those things as more male dominated. Um, it, how How is it in the company? Am I thinking about it the right way? Do I have it um, incorrect? Or is it really just sort of gender neutral? And I'm just, I've just got outdated, outdated views of those things. I think you could view it as being potentially masculine. For me, especially as a finance professional, whether I'm talking about motors or whether I'm at a consumer packaged goods company talking about chips or whether I'm, you know, talking about some other product line, it doesn't influence my job that much because I'm not, I'm not in it. I also think with STEM becoming a larger focus for women up and coming in their careers, and, you know, within education, I think some of these gender barriers are coming down. And so I would like to not think about it something as so much as masculine and feminine. But I think, you know, there's a lot to learn in this industry. There's a lot to get out of it. And so I, I would like us to not put those sort of gender barriers on any type of product, because I think you could do it in a lot of different industries. So the labels are outdated, and that's actually really encouraging to hear, Becca. Um, it, it really is. I appreciate that. So let's talk about your career. So again, 10 years at Granger, you've had eight promotions um, along the way. That's a lot of promotions. How has that worked in terms of the next job? Did you have some, did you have your eye on it? Did you go through structured programs? How, how did you advance your own career within, again, this larger organization? Yeah, I started in a rotational program. So my first three jobs were six month rotations and I didn't have a ton of control over where I went. I I tried to control it as best I could by knowing the different rotations that were available to me, speaking to different leaders who were responsible for that rotation because I I really believe in a push pull. If I'm telling the, the head of the program, hey, I'm really interested in this role and that leader is going to the head of the program and saying, hey, I think Becca might be a good fit for this role that is, you know, a match made in heaven, you're much more likely to succeed. But after that, I think I took an approach of of always having three things in my mind of what I wanted to get out of the next role and being able to articulate those three things clearly. And then I think once you have a strong network of people who understand what it is you're good at, where's your strengths, where's your opportunities, and what are those three things you're looking for, when the opportunities present themselves, they can say, hey, maybe Becca would be a good fit for this because I know that it me- it meets her criteria. And so I haven't targeted specific teams or specific roles, but really focused on what am I going to learn? How is it going to help me advance my career or help me work on a development area and move forward from there? And, and I've been pretty strategic with that. That's how I coach my team to talk about jobs they want, because truthfully, even in an organization as big as Granger, the job that was super interesting two years ago might not be the job that's super interesting today with strategic objectives of the organization. Maybe there was a big problem there and the problem's been fixed. So now it's time to just status quo, which is not what I'm super interested in. So I think it, it's not really looking at who's been in that role before and what have they done, but what it, where's the role going? Where's the organization going? And how do I connect myself to those things? Well, that's also a pretty purposeful approach, okay? You're taking action on talking to different people outside of your current, whatever your team structure might be or the next couple of uh, layers of management and then also um, think thinking ahead. Did you start out that way or are those things that you learned along the way? Are you more purposeful about your career next steps now or have you always been this thoughtful about it? I definitely say it's evolved and I hope that I can speak about it better today than I could, you know, eight years ago, probably. But I think whether or not I was able to articulate it as clearly then as I am now, I had a bunch of great leaders who helped me think about networking, who helped me think about communicating what I want out of my career and what I want out of roles and opportunities. And through that mentorship, I think I was able to find my sort of secret sauce and how I want to think about 
my career moving forward. Okay, well, let's talk about one of those career moves. So you've moved into management, you're leading a team. um, And, you know, after having done a number of things along the way as an individual star contributor. So when you made that move to management, was that a big leap for you? Was that an easy um, step? What were the differences from becoming the leader to being the star performer? It was definitely a big change thinking about being an individual contributor versus a leader. I think the thing I really wanted to do purposefully before I made the jump to leadership was really building my development plan around what were the skills I needed to become a strong people leader out the gate. And I started working on those things long before I took the job. I think it's really important to be showing up as a leader and demonstrating those skills before you move into it because Being a strong analyst is about how do you build the model? How do you think through pulling the data? How do you think through structuring your argument to some extent, but your your leader probably helps you with that. So how do you become a really self-sufficient individual contributor? How do you think about mentorship of others early on? So if you're a senior professional, how do you think about mentoring the professionals below you, giving them advice, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't work from a coaching perspective, taking on prioritization responsibilities, taking on project management responsibilities, and making sure that you're open to those kinds of opportunities that may be in addition to your day job so that when it's time to make the move, it's not brand new. But let me tell you, it was it wasn't easy. It's, it's a hard shift to go from being the one doing the thing to being the one leading someone to do the thing because you are likely in a new department. You don't know the subject as well as you did when you were the one in the weeds. And you have to build credibility really fast that even though that this, the senior analyst might know more than you today, you're there to help and provide support in a new and different way and bringing a different perspective to the team. And I think that's a really big leap. And if you on day one of becoming a manager, that's the first time you're thinking about what skills do I need to be a great manager? You probably moved too quick. So I really tried to take, again, a purposeful approach to my development, making sure I felt ready. Obviously there were things that were unexpected leading my first one-on-one. I feel sorry for the person sitting across the table from me. It did not, it did not go that well, but you live and let you learn and you you get advice from people who mean something to you and and that you think are good at it and and you grow and i think the team overall understands that it's a it's a tough transition and they they grant you a lot of grace Sure, sure. And so, you know, building credibility is one of the things that you talked about. So when you were first becoming a manager, tell t- tell me about some of the things that you, so your first one-on-one, terrible. I hope that person is still there and thriving, <laughs> thriving with you. I'm sure they are. But what, what are some of the things that have worked out really well being a leader? But maybe what are some of the things that did not work out so well, the thing you changed in terms of your approach as a leader? Yeah, I think the thing that has changed the most is I had a very one size fits all solution to management at the beginning, because as a first time manager, I was managing people how I wanted to be managed when I was an individual contributor and recognizing that everyone has different motivations. Everyone has different interest levels and how fast and how far they want to go in their career. And everyone has different strengths. And how do you play to those strengths? How do you delegate work to the right people? Um, Instead of just saying, you know, this person's the rock star, I know they can get it done. How do you make sure that you're, you're spreading the work evenly and thoughtfully and purposefully across the team, and you're treating people and you're managing, managing them more of the way that they would like to be managed versus the way that you would like to manage them. Um, That was not something I thought a ton about. I just thought, hey, I've had great experiences with these types of leaders. I wish leaders maybe did this differently. I'm going to mold to that. And, and you need to be a lot more flexible and understanding that, that what drives one person is going to be a little different than what drives another. I think that's a really good learning. And I will tell you that that, that from, from my perspective, working with lots of managers over many years, I've seen that sort of, you know, thinking that there's one way, but then learning and incorporating the many views of the different types of people and the strengths that they bring um, to, to a team. So that's just fantastic, Becca. H- how are you doing in terms of delegating work? That's another sort of common um, issue for early managers. Was that something that you had to learn or um, did you do it well right out of the gate? I think that actually was a strength for me. I, I will say there was a benefit. We were changing our systems 
And I didn't learn the new way how to pull data from the new system <laughs> that we were migrating to sort of purposefully as a way to say, okay, if I can't pull it myself, then I have to involve my team. I have to go to my team. I need to use them and let them be the ones to shine and do the analysis and think through it and provide those insights to leadership. And I'm here to coach and develop and assist them when they have questions. And so it was sort of lucky timing for me. And so delegation early on was not something that I had to worry too much about because I, I actually couldn't do it myself. Well, that, that is fortunate because that is a that is a tra that is definitely an early management trap. I'm glad that wasn't one um, that you had to fall into. Becca, let's talk about this past year. I mean, we are we are not yet out of this pandemic. It's been a year of change on almost every level for um, almost everyone, and for many people, um, at, you know, sort of I would just say your age group. For many folks, it's been a lost year in terms of career progression or advancement. Advancement. Uh, how, how has it impacted you? How has it impacted your team? Have you been able to focus on career progression? Has that been something that just has been impossible to think about during, during this period of time? What's been going on there? Yeah, a couple different, couple different questions within that. I think I'll start with number one, which is, it was a struggle initially to think about how to work successfully from home how to collaborate successfully from home, how to, you know, not just be excited that you get to be in leggings every day and, and really think about the implications that it, it means for your team and how they interact. And so early on, it was really critical that we set up forums and places to have as close of an in-person experience as we, we could. Definitely a ton of learnings along the way. I now institute um, team video days. So there's set days every week where we come together. And if we're on calls, just as a team that we agree to turn on our videos in order to feel a little bit more connected. Additionally, you know, I think being on video all, all the time is it, it's proving to be pretty exhausting for a lot of people, especially introverts. So as you think about that inclusion and diverse team that you want to build, thinking about requiring video all the time actually might be stifling some involvement from the quieter people or more introverted people on your team was a great learning for me. So not to do it all the time, but to have structured time to do that as a team. I think finding ways to celebrate wins was really important because naturally that would happen after a meeting, you walk out of the room, you talk about the meeting on the way back to your desk, you talk about what went well, you talk about what didn't go well. And so you need to find thoughtful ways to structure that because it's not happening organically. And then in terms of thinking about how it's impacted career progression, I definitely say it slowed things down from a networking perspective. At least initially, there was so much work going on with how is the business going to manage through all this change? How are we going to continue to serve our customers? What is happening with our suppliers? You know, what is inventory levels look like? Do we need to think about furloughs or, or other, you know, very critical decisions we need to make to be successful as an organization and do the right thing for our people. And so there was just enough work to go around that you could not, not be thinking so much about networking. But I think now that it's more of a steady state, those one-on-one -on -one mentor conversations are coming back. We're finding more of that structured time to meet and have conversations about development Throughout all of it, it's mandated that you have at least one quarterly development session with everyone on your team. So I was able to maintain those because I think they're, they're really important at a minimum to be talking to your people once a quarter about their long-term development plan. Those are great, great pieces of advice. I like some of those tips. I might bring them back for uh, my own my own work, Becca. So I appreciate that. As we close out here, it's been such a great conversation. And you know, as you think about yourself and having done all that you've accomplished already um, in your career, do you think like you know what you want to do in the next five, ten years? What are you thinking about next? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm definitely thinking about what comes next. I've been in the finance world for nine years. I think there's a lot of benefit to seeing more of the organization, even if my long-term goals are to stay within finance. Being an operating partner and understanding that side of the world, I think would only make me a stronger finance partner in the future. And so it's really thinking about longer-term 
again, what skills and experiences are going to set you up for a long and successful career where you have the opportunity to work on a lot of different things? I think finding ways to open more doors than to close them is important, especially early in your career. And so I think being purposeful about what comes next and, and what you want out of your career. Is it managing a really big team because that's what gets you super excited? Is it being super focused on strategy, in which case you're probably never going to have a super large organization because those jobs just typically aren't structured that way? And how do you set yourself up to be ready for those things in the future? And if you want to do both, how do you make sure you keep all the doors open? So definitely having in-depth conversations with my mentors about what comes next, what doors I want to keep open, and at this point, what doors I'm going to have to close. And this is really probably the first move where some doors might close because I, I don't make a decision and that's new and different for me. So definitely don't have a, a, a strict plan of what the next five years can look like because the job that I want might not even exist yet. But the types of things and the types of roles that I see myself in, I'm definitely thinking a lot about that and, and how to set myself up, up for success to get there. Well, the thinking about the long term by setting yourself up for success, that is really terrific advice. As we close out here, Becca, any last thoughts that you want to leave listeners with, whether it's um, questions you want me to ask other um, people that I talk to, or just last advice you want to want to leave the audience with? I think one piece of advice that I was thinking a lot about as I prepped for this call was how to think about talent and talent and thinking about how you hire and bring in and coach the right talent. And what I'd say about that is, is I found that I always look for three things the most in an interview. We have principles that we, we make sure that we interview on so that people you know, follow our goals and, and values. But I think for me, the three keys to success have really been curiosity, analytical thought or problem solving, and drive. Because if you're curious, you're going to ask the right questions and get down to the meat of what's working and what's not working. If you're a problem solver, you can figure out how to address the things that are working and not working and come up with solutions. And if you have drive, you're going to do that proactively and show up really well to people around you. I think drive is one of the hardest things to coach. So it's probably one of the things I test for the most in an interview situation about how are you proactive? How do you learn when no one asks you to? How do you look into things when no one asks you to? Because I've really found that at least in, in my world and, and my team, those have really been the, the things that I think have made me successful and make the people on my team successful. And how they do it can show up in different ways, but I really feel like those are the three pillars of, of being a successful employee. Well, Becca, those are really terrific pillars, and I love that advice, so thank you for sharing that. Um, this has been an inspiring women conversation with this young, inspiring woman, Becca Marks, and Becca, thank you so much. Thank you. really appreciate the time. This has been an episode of Inspiring Women with Lori McGraw. Please subscribe, rate, and review. We are produced by Kate Cruz at Executive Podcast Solutions. More episodes can be found on inspiringwomen.show. I am Lori McGraw, and thank you for listening.